Yeah, today I will present uh, work in progress on the open data architecture for mobility as a service or in short mass industry. And uh, just as a quick background, I'm professor of economics at Simon Fraser University and I'm director of the small think tank selfdrivingcities.com working with uh, students on uh, questions of uh, how do new technologies in the transportation sector these new platforms that you guys, um, I, I assume the audience is mostly programmers for APIs and apps. Um, if that is correct, then probably some of you have been looking into the platforms that are programmed for some of the companies that are in the mass, so in the mobility as a service industry, for example, Lyft, Uber, shared bicycle companies, shared scooter companies, or even aggregator apps such as Google Maps, um, Transit, City Mapper. These are all new technologies out there that are now more accessible to everyone because everyone is working around with cell phones. And these create incredible new opportunity, opportunities for the transport transportation sector as a whole. And for me as an economist, I'm interested how these new technologies affect a bunch of economic outcomes, such as air quality in the city, real estate prices, uh, business life, how does it shift, congestion, and so on and so forth. But importantly, how mobility as a service and in the future AV stands for autonomous vehicles, so basically that's a computer on wheels. How do these new devices will affect, improve, or deteriorate our way how we commute and our cities crucially depends on what kind of policies and regulations jurisdictions are putting in place. So a lot of our work in the Institute is to look how these policies affect then economic outcomes, but also how these policies affect the market structure of the mobility as a service industry itself. Um, out of our work then come uh, a lot of um, policy recommendations and for the purpose of today's talks, I will focus purely on the policy recommendations that come out, how the new data architecture should, could or should be designed in order to have uh, an economic outcome and a welfare distribution that is good for both the companies, but also the consumer and the government, the whole society as a whole. As an economist, we always want to maximize the welfare function for the whole society and not work in the interest of one particular company. But typically we want to create like a competitive environment where companies work for the overall good of the society. So uh, quickly as background, what is mass? What is mobility as a service? shortly said that basically all the devices that you do not own yourself but that you rent for a particular trip right so the bus train uh, the shared cars the uh, uber mm. and lifts out there the docked bike bicycle stations that you now see over many cities the dockless bicycles and then uh, recently uber acquired the company jump which is an electric bicycle company you can rent these devices and go throughout your town. The mass um, now goes forward into the micro mobility. That is a term for these new fun devices that you can also rent via apps. We observe in that industry uh, a massive takeoff. Right? So um, this is already all data by 2018, but you see all of these um, platforms are enjoying increased uh, user base and there are predictions out there that by the year 2030 the market share in some of the cities of trips taken by mass devices will be 50% um, or so in certain areas of all of all trips taken overall uh, compared to the private vehicle. Uh, what we also observe in that industry that there is a massive market concentration going on. So just to give a couple of examples here from the US, Lyft 
uh, meanwhile owns 80% of all bike share rights in the US uh, because they acquired the bike share company Motivate. So Lyft is not only a ride hailing company, it's also more like a, a company that wants to go like, Am like being an Amazon for urban transportation, but they also offer um, in the future transit tickets, but they offer bicycles, uh, uh, scooter rides, um, and also ride hailing. Uh, uh, Uber is going in, in the exactly same direction. They also try to be the Amazon for, for urban transportation. And then third, uh, Mercedes-Benz with, with Car2Go, they had the merger later on with, uh, with BMW on uh, their program on Reach Now. They also tried to compete in that space. In North America, um, they, they could not, so they, they fell out. So basically what we see in this, in this industry is a massive market concentration towards one, two companies that are left within, within a city. And we study uh, the economics around it. And uh, John T. Rowe, who got the Nobel Prize for uh, some of these ideas, applied to social network platforms um, has, a, has a great model that you can also apply to the mass industry. So basically, you guys are programming here this uh, platform, like uh, Uber and Lyft. And then the more drivers are out there, the more the less is a waiting time for the rider or the more riders are out there, the less is a deadheading. So basically a taxi driver or ride hailing uh, driver driving empty around in the city, the lower are the marginal cost and the higher is the probability of actually finding pooled rides that uh, lowers further the marginal cost of each trip and actually increases the environmental quality of the trip itself. So these are the reasons, these positive indirect network effects are the reasons why these platforms tend to monopolize. Um, in economics, we make a distinction between a monopoly and a walled garden. A monopoly is one company that offers one product. So for example, um, Uber just offering ride hailing. A uh, walled garden in com comparison is a monopoly that offers multiple services. So now Uber also offering electric bicycles plus uh, scooters, Uber scooters, is now offering multiple services. And from a city perspective, or first, let me back up, from a consumer perspective, at first glance, that may seem as a very positive uh, development because the consumer only needs to open one app and then you can see all transportation options on this one um, device instead of flipping through 15 different apps. You don't need to do that anymore. Uh, because this one walled garden offers everything. But from a city perspective, there are several concerns. First, data policy. Um, there are reports that if you get consistently bad ratings on Lyft or Uber, then actually Uber, uh, these companies can close your account. So um, in the corona uh, epidemic in, in Mexico, uh, two months ago, there were reports that um, Uber closed um, a couple hundred accounts of uh, Uber users because they were um, uh, connected to some corona case. Uh, but that is then a problem for, for, for the city if uh, public transportation relies on just one company and then we are subject to their data policy. The second risk is uh, pricing. So we all, economists all agree on that a walled garden in particular but also a monopoly is uh, always in the long run offering the product at a lower quality to a higher price compared to a competitive market. So me as an economist, I wanna think about how can we push the mobility as a service industry into an area where we have more competition going on um, instead of this walled garden. And what kind of new data architecture can we prescribe that will, that will allow that. Um, the third risk for the city of a walled garden is strategic behavior. So assume outside of your office building, there is a jump bike by Uber, but an Uber driver may not have had a ride for the last 10 minutes. 
So there is a concern that then such a company may display the more valuable option for them to you on your app and not display the other. This is strategic behavior that walled gardens can potentially engage to. I don't say that Uber is doing that or Lyft is doing that, but there is a risk at walled gardens in general that they can discriminate different services um, in such a way to their own advantage, um, especially if there's a lack of other competitors around. And finally, a walled garden has the uh, disadvantage that the technology is potentially locked in um, in an inferior equilibrium. So let's say uh, Mayuka, who did the um, kind introduction here this morning for me, um, that Mayuka invented a new electric bicycle that is actually better from the standard than the jump bike. But Mayuka doesn't have millions of dollars. She only has a couple thousand that she got. So she may put 100 bicycles into the city. The problem is nobody will open the Mayuka app because it's just the market share is too small. What if we had a data architecture where we had an aggregator app such as Google Maps or Expedia for urban transportation or Transit or City Map or whatever you want to call them, who is allowed to display all mobility options? Then actually the Mayuka bike would also be displayed there if people use the aggregator app. And if the Mayuka bike is truly of a better quality than the competitor, then actually people may be able to walk like one or two blocks more to get that bicycle. That is, and so slowly the market share of a uh, superior technology actually takes place instead of a walled garden where those comp competitions are not possible. Um, so in a sense, um, because of this market, monopolization that we observe in the mobility as a service industry. Our aim here uh, for me as an economist is to think about antitrust policy options that will break up this network effects and uh, in such a way that it's still good for the consumers, um, but also good to have more competition out there in that space so we don't get into a walled garden situation. And I already now displayed for you what is the uh, baseline scenario, the unregulated market, the John T. Wall model where you get these strong network effects. And basically uh, in the rest of the talk, I will briefly go through these uh, four other policy options that are out there that some of the cities already are implementing as antitrust policies in the new mobility industry. Um, and our favorite one is the mid-layer API, mid-layer approach as a public utility. And I want to explain that next. So uh, first of all, let me describe a little bit the market structure in that mobility as a service space. So first of all, you have the operators which are Uber, Lime, Lyft, um, your local public transportation provider and so, so forth. But all of these operators basically want to be the Amazon for urban transportation, right? So Uber will try to kind of like integrate all other uh, <clears throat> mobility options into their platform and monopolize um, the market. On the other hand, you have these aggregator apps uh, such as Google Maps, uh, Expedia for urban transportation, and so on. Uh, WIM is one here in, in Helsinki. And these aggregator apps, they want to, uh, they are forming contracts with the operators in getting their data. And in fact, until 2017, it was a case that the operators actually were quite willing to share some of the data with the aggregator apps. And so basically what you were observing that there was a competition out there among operators and a competition among aggregator apps as well. Um, but then something shifted um, in 2017, 2018. At that point, the operators actually understood better the value of their own data. And instead of giving the data 
to the aggregators, many of these companies decided, no, I want that the end user only operates on our app only and doesn't book us through third party applications. Um, what Finland has done uh, is quite interesting. Uh, that was the first country to say that uh, the, this data is so valuable, especially also for the aggregator space, that it's also so beneficial for the end consumer to see everything in one platform, that all the operators that are operating in Helsinki or in, um, in Finland have to share mandatory, it's a mandatory policy that they have to share the data with aggregator apps. The remaining problem then was, uh, many problems, but like one of the remaining problem uh, was that the, if all the aggregators now are hitting the servers of all the operator companies, then basically the operator companies want to start charging some money for that access because literally their servers run hot. Um, in addition to the aggregators that want to get all the information from the operators, the operators itself want to get all the information from their competitors. So there's a massive amount every, so these devices move this all in real time. And everyone wants to know where to place the bicycles uh, as a function of other companies, uh, strategic behavior. And so um, strategically the companies then cut off, try to cut off the link to the other ones. And um, to and so because there is a, a cost for these operators to provide that data uh, to aggregators, um, the, most of the operators decided not to share the data anymore. And if so, at a very, very high cost. Uh, what we did here in British Columbia, so I'm here in, in Vancouver, Canada, is to create an in-between governmental run mid-layer. It's called the API um, mid-layer or borrowed from the airline industry, the computer reservation system. This has the advantage that the API mid-layer is now scanning all the devices about every two to five seconds, depending if Friday busy night uh, to avoid overbookings and it's every two minutes if it's uh, in the middle of a night on a Tuesday maybe every five to every ten seconds is enough to avoid uh, multiple bookings but in a sense this uh, computer reservation system is scanning all the devices only once every couple of seconds and then the public utility is selling that data to the aggregator space uh, and that's actually quite similar to what's also happening in the electricity market. So this is a data, new data architecture that jurisdictions are, are thinking about and that um, I, as an economist, I'm, I'm studying the welfare implications and basically with this, with this data architecture, we see a number of benefits. So first, <clears throat> in a healthy competitive aggregator space uh, everyone has a possibility to see all mobility options in one app second small suppliers can compete yeah so mayuka's bicycle could actually be shown there um, the competition leads to lower transportation prices it ensures that always the most innovative product is at the market we no longer have the world garden strategic behavior problem and we actually get a competitive market on both sides, the operator space and the aggregator space. In addition, then um, the mid layer sets the price for the aggregators and the mid layer also, and this is around a little bit on my screen, um, can use this data for research, urban planning uh, and other third party applications such as congestion pricing in cities and carbon offsets. You could also imagine a situation where 
this API mid-layer public utility is not only selling the data to the aggregator space, but maybe selling it at different prices. For example, a city may want that electric um, vehicles get um, have an incentive to be displayed uh, with a larger icon on the API, on, the, uh, on, the, on your app compared to um, a brown SUV ride. Uh, or that, that um, the um, electric um, rides are displayed or are, are sold at a, at a lower price to the aggregator space or even given for free to the aggregator space and then brown rides are charged a higher price. So there are many ways how the API mid layer, this computer reservation system can now manage the data and the, as we know, this data is gold in that industry and make it really to the best use for the society and creating both a competitive operator space and a competitive aggregator space. Um, maybe for this audience, uh, just very quickly, what would be the data requirements? Of course, like you need the location of all available devices out there, the vehicle type, the pricing matrix, uh, battery fuel level. Uh, some regulatory steps um, need to prevent malicious compliance, such as uh, <clears throat> a company may uh, display only the Y-class ticket, like in the in the airline industry, to the aggregator space, and then have cheaper S-class tickets on their own app. So you have to kind of prevent that there is this uh, differentiation going on, so that really all mobility options are displayed to the aggregator space and not only the subset. There are certain data formats out there, uh, but maybe that goes too much into the details. Okay, uh, if I have some minutes left, then I would like to compare this open data, like by law open data policy with uh, the policy options that are currently used in the mobility uh, as a service industry. Uh, first is exclusive contracts with one aggregator. So cities are often um, <clears throat> aggregating that data to one white label aggregator that the city is, is running. Um, the advantage of that is that the city has full control of what is displayed. The disadvantage is that there's no competitive aggregator space and then also less incentives to innovate. Right. So, for example, my father, he is uh, 92 years old. He has a cell phone, but he wants to have an aggregator likely that is very simple to use. Whereas my daughter probably can handle an aggregator app where she can triple click and uh, wipe to the left and right. And so it's good to have market differentiation also in the aggregator space and not only one aggregator out there. And um, also another disadvantage of having an exclusive contract is that it relies on bilateral contracts with operators and single point of failure, right? So uh, the reason why I put in two API mid-layer boxes is because if one fails, like do a blackout, then at least the other is still running. And that is important because these operators, including your public transportation system, is, is an essential service, right? If you have to go to the hospital at 3 a.m. in the morning, you better make sure that this API mid layer is running in real time and has a proper contract. So, um, <clears throat> another way as an antitrust policy that cities have been implemented um, um, in in this industry is uh, supply caps. Um, the supply caps basically function that, okay, Uber gets 10,000 vehicles, Lyft gets 5,000 vehicles, Line gets so and so many devices, and these are pretty much fixed. Uh, sometimes you can buy and sell these shares. We basically all know that from the taxi industry, um, and the taxi industry in the 1920s, 1930s, in New York City during the during the Great Recession, uh, more and more immigrants came and became taxi drivers. And then the taxi 
driver association itself actually lobbied to have a cap on the amount of taxi drivers because they were giving, <coughs> putting their, uh, the, uh, themselves out of business by having too many taxi drivers out there. So they lobbied to have uh, a license model, a medallion system where, and then the government said, well, that's actually a good idea. Uh, for every taxi now needs a $10 taxi license. But then as soon as the economy um, took off, um, then one good taxi driver said, oh, okay, can I buy your taxi driver license um, for $20 and then the next one for $50 and then $100. And so the price went up and up and up in New York City up to 1.3 million until 2000, around 11, when Uber came into New York and that whole thing crashed to about 10% of that value. So <clears throat> these kind of caps are now also discussed for the ride hailing and mobility as a service industry in general. But we know that these shadow prices really put like a large burden onto the industry itself. And it's very hard once you have such a system in place, we also know that from agriculture, like milk quotas, and many other industries, uh, once you have these rent seeking in place, it's very hard to, to get rid of them. So we don't want to repeat these historical mistakes now in, these, in the new mobility as a service industry. So instead of having supply caps, um, we as an economist and in our uh, self-driving cities institute together with uh, BC government and TransLink, which is our local provider, we are thinking very hard about this new data architecture. Um, and it actually just got implemented in the, on the legislative side. The BC is the first jurisdiction in North America to aggressively demand open data from now from all operators. Uh, the advantages, again, are free competition produces innovation, quality improvements, and lower price for the consumer. And so we can, can protect competition by promoting an open data and uh, creating a computer reservation system as a public utility creates uh, additional benefits of lower data transfer costs between the aggregator space and the operators and the data in the end can be used for public needs, uh, the opportunity to collect additional data for regulation, research, carbon offsets, congestion pricing, and many other applications, uh, advertisement. Okay, with that, um, I conclude and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you.